So this week we're going to be focusing on drawing the figure as well as something called foreshortening. So you can see here, I'm gonna like put my arms straight out at you. And what we know from our intellectual side of the brain is that our arms have length, right? But when we have to draw it compressed in space coming out at you, see how large, you know, my hands are? versus my arms basically disappear. You don't see them, and so you have to imagine them. Even though you know it's this long, you can't draw it that way because that's not how it visually appears, right? Um, and the same like with my knees, you see? Like you know that I have this length of my leg, but you don't see it when you try to draw it in space. Um, and, and something that's coming like straight out at you becomes very compressed and it's actually a very complex Drawing problem that we'll work on. So what we're gonna do is to produce um, Two drawings one will be with this sort of compressed foreshortened space of the figure and one will be to the side of You know the elongated part of the figure as we know that length uh, intellectually um, so when you do something that is foreshortened like that, you have to think of the arms, you know, if you wrapped your hand around the arm, a series of overlapping circles that come out at you. They're stacked one upon each other, almost straight in front of each other in space to get that sense of the arm coming out from the socket. And the same with the legs, or even like if I bent forward the top of my head or something like that. If there was a strange point of view, we can't assume that we know, you know, what it's going to be and let our intellectual side of our brain, you know, just, you know, um, generalize it. We don't want that to happen. We need to draw it exactly as we see it. So we need to really think about um, what's happening spatially and what we actually see in front of us rather than what we assume that we know. So let's see what we can do and get started. I've got my drawing paper 18 by 24 um, laid out. I always tape it down because I often use uh, wet media with my work. I'm going to create uh, two drawings um, on one sheet of paper. Um, on one, I'm going to work on you know the compression of the space and I have my daughter here to um, help me with modeling. And with this one, I'm gonna use um, my graphite pencils and water soluble pencil um, and perhaps a little bit of a matte medium to push things around. Um, and that will be for the one that I'm doing the foreshortening on. And then I'm gonna do another image, uh, which is a similar pose of the figure spread out towards the side, you know, regarding what my intellectual brain knows. And with that, I'm gonna use um, my red Conte and white, maybe a little bit of yellow and my eraser and um, get started. So in the beginning, I'm gonna kind of work on this sort of first section and then that other section as I do each one of these drawings. Um, I also wanna make sure I have my you know, pencil sharpener handy um, as I need it. And when you do any drawing, like I've been um, training you from the start of this course, is that you always start with a gesture. Um, a gesture with graphite is generally best, you know, with a harder pencil, you can make a lighter line, just lay things out really quickly. So, you know, figure drawing gesture is super quick. You know, think about like where the weight of the figure is and what all you need to include. So what I'm expecting to see from you is a sense of that foreshortening and the gesture drawing probably isn't gonna be perfect because foreshortening certainly isn't an easy thing to depict. So um, this is a complex visual problem, a spatial problem that is important for you to sort of start to get a handle on early on, even in this you know, first stage of your drawing um, education. So here I have, yeah, basic gesture drawing, drawing through the figure, arms, so I'm getting some joints in here, uh, shoulder, this arm disappears, we got a knee that's really close to where that arm is, and then this really large foot out here that looks like it's, you know, 
bigger than her head. So, head that big, foot that big. So, that gives you an idea of how she's gonna sit. There's a hand coming out down here as well. And there is my gesture drawing to start with. Now, from there, you know, you might wanna switch to a little bit darker pencil. It's, it's kind of up to you. Uh, maybe I'll go to a B. And then start to map out my proportion and scale using my organizational lines, my sighting lines, like I've talked to you about. Um, the important measurements are gonna be, you know, like, you know, the top of that knee. Like, think about, like, where's the halfway point on this figure? Where would the waist be, for instance? And like, how much of the, you know, the figure is above the waist, how much below? So, you know, halfway here on her, we have about the top of the knee there. And then, you know, I have um, the rest of the torso up to the top of the head up above. Um, and then you can also, you know, decide how big is that head gonna be and use the different parts of the body to gauge the proper proportion and scale as you go through trying to define that figure. You know, like where, if I drew a line straight down from the side of the head, what feature would it hit on? It would actually hit, um, you know, close to where um, that arm goes out. So I need to probably extend that hand and so this is the point where you make sure that you get things correct so that you don't invest too much time into something that's incorrect and like spend all this time developing something that you end up seeing is, is wrong later and you have to change the whole thing after you put all this time into it. So I do spend a good amount of time making sure that at this stage I get my proportion and scale correct. Super important. And then you've got, in this drawing, I have, you know, several things that are foreshortened, you know, different parts of the arm, because I already see that, you know, this section of the arm is quite a bit shorter than what I first drew it at. And then the leg might come in a little bit as well. So this type of drawing takes a good bit of practice. So now that, you know, once you've learned, you know, how this is gonna work for you with this drawing, you can take what you've learned here and advance it in terms of your skills with future drawings that you do. So now we know foreshortening is a way to render an object or a figure that shows depth in a little bit different way than perspective is, which we covered uh, earlier. When we draw something that's foreshortened, it's basically an optical illusion that's created because something looks compressed. The challenge of foreshortening does not really come from the model or the particular pose, it comes from the brain. So if you can more consciously understand what your brain is doing and break it down and understand it fully, drawing a foreshortened view becomes much easier. So as I've been stating multiple times throughout this course, the intellectual side of your brain often interferes and makes so-called known assumptions about what you're seeing. You know, the intellectual side of your brain is a bit of a know-it-all, really. It says, hey, that's a leg. I know it has length. I don't care if it's not what I see. I just know that it is, and so that is how it has to be. But no, that is not right. You must tell the inner voice to shut up. Because honestly, you know, talking and drawing don't really mix. You know, when you're actually physically drawing, you know, we often aren't talking. Um, the main problems associated with drawing is when you engage your logical, language-dominated left side of your brain. You know, this side of your brain is, is keen on knowing an object's name, on labeling it and organizing it. Um, but often in learning to draw, you need to temporarily hold off judgment and try not to second guess what you think the object should look like, rather than what the object actually looks like. 
When you're trying to learn to draw something realistically, you have to engage your right hand side of your brain, which is keener on images and spatial perception. You know, it's very hard to do both at the same time. So why is that, do you wonder? Um, it's really because it causes a kind of a mind freeze. You know, so have you ever been really in a creative zone of absorption, a state where, you know, time travels very quickly and you're in this sort of psycho psychological flow? So flow um, is stated by psychologists as this mental state when you're fully immersed in an activity, a feeling of full involvement and energy. So you can get to this stage of involvement while you're drawing until you get interrupted. So the combination of left and right battling against each other makes trying to draw tricky. And you can learn to draw at the same time, but it takes practice. It all starts by understanding how your mind works and how you can be consciously sabotaging your best efforts. So often, you know, successes in our lives stem from our own internal beliefs. And these can be crippling both in your progress as an artist or in any other areas of your life. You know, if you keep on thinking that you can't draw, you won't. So as you try and draw something realistically and it starts to go wrong, your inner critic starts to rear its head. So often drawings start off really well and you observe things accurately. It's only when you get to a perceived sort of tricky bit that you start to question yourself. You know, the truth is that you probably started to sort of make up the rest of the drawing and have stopped observing, relying on what you think it looks like. So in comes the inner critic and that says, you know, that doesn't look like a boat. I give up now. It's like a kid's done it. So what we have to do is to stop labeling objects and not give up and start looking more abstractly. So in drawing, you are constantly trying to disassociate from labeling real objects so your logical left brain can't try to tell you how to draw what it recognizes. It seems wrong, it seems backwards, but this is why you can't draw. To see, like an artist, you have to learn to make a cognitive shift from left brain to right brain. So if you keep on talking to yourself, engaging your inner critic, you will be really firing up the left side of the brain. So if you work really hard to try to utilize these tools I've been showing you, like with, you know, using uh, the horizontal and vertical measurements with sighting and mapping, really it's super important to you know, think about not, you know, labeling what you're seeing, but really just seeing as overlapping shapes and forms um, and looking at them logically in space. So as you've seen me drawing um, this piece here, you know, I have been doing like we've done in the past in switching pencils as I go, starting light and moving darker um, as the drawing progresses. And then you can also see me switching to a water soluble graphite to start to put in some of those values. Um, when I work with things that are more complicated like hands and feet for instance, you can see the hands where I actually join the um, individual fingers into something that's a lo little bit more like a mitten and really just focus on those horizontal joint movements where the finger bends and so you see those horizontal lines actually on that hand that I've drawn there. So there's a lot of things that, you know, you can try to do to help yourself to, you know, not let that inner critic of yours, you know, get out. You really have to um, just continue to utilize your drawing tool to measure those forms, compare elements, you know, draw a line from that hand and see where does it hit you know, on that arm up above, or where does the hand up above hit on that leg down below? And, you know, how much space really is there between, you know, the knee and the bottom of the foot? Or how big is that giant foot coming out at me versus the other foot that's a little bit further back? So that will help you to, you know, really get this correct in space as you develop your drawing. It's really important to really honestly take those comparative measurements. You know, that's something that I'm doing all the time, holding up my drawing tool and comparing where does this, you know, lie in relation to that? How big is this in relation to that within my drawing? And within one figure, you can do that, you know, comparing the two feet. Where does the end of the toe on the one foot hit on the other, for instance? How wide is the figure overall versus the height of the figure? 
there's so many things that you can do to like really, you know, test your brain, make sure that you're getting things down in space. It does take a bit of time in the beginning. Um, but this idea of flow is something that I like quite a lot um, that psychologists have developed recently, where I watched this documentary about happiness and this notion of flow was something that was common in people who were happy. And drawing can help to give something like that to you. You know, no matter what your particular major is, this working with drawing is a way of meditating, a way of like um, coming to a certain quietness and an observation and um, becoming a little bit more meditative on your environment and your surroundings and even like allowing yourself to process things in your life. So think of drawing in a, in a lot of different ways that it, how it can help you creatively and help you to sort of rejuvenate yourself. And don't think that you can't do it because you can. Drawing is definitely a learned skill. So now you see me moving on to doing an a elongated version of this same leg. So a similar pose I had my daughter do and you saw her do this sort of goofy face for me. So I guess I decided to draw that in red Conte. So we have like nice daughter versus sort of the devilish daughter who decided to go cross-eyed for me in this photo. Um, and in this one, you know, I suppose I let my intellectual side of my brain have a little bit of knowledge knowing that that leg is elongated. But I think it's also really important to take a look at that carefully and draw them side by side and really take note of the difference, you know, of that pose and how it changes spatially for you when you're drawing. And, you know, having that there on the paper as that comparison is, is quite interesting. And also this is, you know, not necessarily the most like beautiful drawing in the world either. You know, it's not always about drawing beauty. It's also about drawing something that has some character to it, which is why, you know, I like that she made this sort of goofy face, which is sort of unnatural to her, but, you know, having those sort of two images of the daughter, my daughter sitting side by side, and each having a little bit of a different expression um, is, is kind of amusing and, and interesting to me. So again, you can see on this one where I'm doing the red Conte, um, I use a little bit of white as well, and then also going in with some woodless pencil to help to clarify some edges. I'm doing the same sort of thing where I'm drawing lines across, measuring how high is that toe and where does it hit on that knee that's extended. So that's super important to force yourself to do, you know, these sorts of things in order to help yourself get it right. You know, the first couple of drawings are going to take some time. They're going to be a little bit more difficult. But the more you do it, the faster it goes, the easier it becomes, and over time, it just becomes something like second nature. And I think it was also kind of interesting how it's, it is true that like drawing and talking don't necessarily go together. You know, in order for me to be able to talk and draw, I've been doing this for whatever, you know, however many 20 some years. And, you know, with being a teacher, you know, the talking and drawing is something that, um, I've become accustomed to in order to help my students to really um, learn and um, understand the process. So just talking you through that process is helpful, but also, you know, doing these voice voiceovers is really helpful so that I can also make sure that I hit every single point that I'm covering in that drawing. So you can see me like adding in some white acrylic as well for highlights and then filling out some interesting aspects of the environment. So when you're doing this composition, don't forget about that space around the figure. The figure should not be floating in midair in emptiness. So, you know, give it some context um, or some atmosphere. You can see she's sort of sitting on this chair. And then by the end of it, I give her a little bit more of an environment to sit in. And then I've got kind of a unique looking um, drawing uh, that I end up becoming quite happy with.